Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, Pitching to the Buyer, the fifth of the six Appetite for Angus get-togethers. Um, it's great to have you all with us this evening. I uh, hope you're going to find this really useful. What we're going to cover today is uh, we're going to look at some 60-second pitches and hear from you, so thank you for that. And then we're going to lo look at you know, how you perfect your pitch, what sort of things should, should you involve in that pitch. And that could be pitching face-to-face, or it could be pitching online, so we're all going to, we're going to cover that as well. And then we're going to look at a bit at negotiation, some of the do's and don'ts, and give you some hints and tips around how to get the best deal and negotiate uh, to your best capability. And then we're going to open up the floor and we're going to share our ideas, maybe do a, a revised picture or two, and really sort of get into some good Q&A um, around um around the around the table tonight so thank you to those that have already pitched and, and given us some examples of their pitches we really appreciate that just looking at the slide um there what's the common thread amongst all those photos you see in front of you on the screen okay so yeah everyone is standing in what they call the power pose and Doing this 60 seconds for 60 seconds or so actually has been proven to reduce cortisol, raise testosterone and improve confidence, lowering stress. So this is what we should all be doing, guys, before we go into a pitch. Now, when Callum and I have done this face to face with 60 people in Inverness was the last time we did this at the, uh, at the Anne Lochran uh, facility. We did this exercise with everybody standing up and doing this power pose. Anybody fancy doing that? You might need to switch your cameras off if you've got your joggers on. Are, gonna, are we going to try it? Right. If camera's off, let's all stand up for 60 seconds and do that power pose. All right. Put those shoulders down, back. Feel really powerful. Sophie, you've been so brave keeping that camera on. That's because it's going to turn it off. I can't because I'm, I'm from the bottom down. I look dreadful. <laughs> Callum, you'll need to tell me when 60 minutes is up. All I can see is my reflection in my window. 60 minutes? I'm posing. Love it. <laughs> right. Camera's on again. That's my daily laugh done. <laughs> <laughs> can't get my camera. Oh. Right. Right. How do you fit? Did anyone actually do that? Did, did 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 everyone do that? I'm not sure. There's some people looking in very similar positions that we were looking in five minutes, two minutes ago. Brilliant. How did that make you feel? Did it break the ice? It's supposed to be a little bit more weak. Yeah, good. It's supposed to that sort of just that, that pose to get you sort of set or thinking that. And so that's that's uh, that's how we should all be preparing whenever, however we're going to pitch, really. But we we thought we'd add, um, you know, normally that's what you do before you go into into a buyer's office. That's sometimes what I would do before a supplier came in, because if I knew the supplier, I might have needed the energy as well. But um, we we've added in a slide, or Callum has added in a slide, which I think is really important as well. So before we get into sort of the the structure of a good pitch. Um, I, I'm just going to ask Callum to run through a slide on pitching digitally because we're all in this digital uh, era. So over to you, Callum. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Kerry. I think just just sort of re rewinding there back to the power pose um, is one of these things that standing up and getting into that strong, powerful position does help your confidence. Um, you know, it really does. And I mean, I, even I remember when I, before I got this job, uh, that was the first thing that I almost like did before I went into the interview. Yeah, Kerry's laughing, casting her minds back, but just, you know, helping yourself to not only relax yourself, but just give you the confidence, which is just really important. But anyway, um, I'm just gonna sort of start off um, by talking about pitching digitally. Uh, now I know that um, you know, I'm usually quite quiet on these sessions. I usually sit behind the scenes and do the, the, the sort of technical stuff. But this, for me, is quite important because the current world that we're living in, um, you know, you may, if you haven't already, 
uh, you may be in a situation where you're asked um, or you have to pitch um, to potential buyers digitally uh, over screen rather than um, doing it face to face. Now, throughout lockdown, we've, we've all had to sort of brush up on our digital skills. Um, so when we've been using Zoom, Microsoft Teams, go to meeting among you know, other platforms to communicate with friends, family, and for business. But have you ever actually thought about how you present yourself on screen? And that's something that had never really triggered in my mind is, you know, how, how do you look? How do you come across? How do you communicate? And it's something that for me is, is really important, particularly if you're asked to, to, to pitch um, digitally in, in the future. So I guess um, here's some of my, or some of our sort of top tips, uh, if you like. And the first one I'd like to touch on is, is your background. Um, now, your background in terms of when you're presenting or, or pitching digitally, you know, lockdown, lockdown's given us a unique insight into each other's homes, into each other's personal lives, and also like the wonderful array of bookshelves that we all seem to have in, in our homes. Um, I don't know about you, but when I meet someone for the first time, or someone that I don't necessarily speak to very often, the first thing that I look at is their background. You know, what's going on in their house? What's um, you know what's on that shelf over there? You know, look at the size of that TV. My attention is not on the person speaking. So from from the beginning, you really want your buyer to be focused on you and only you. Okay, not what's going on in the background. So find somewhere in your house or office where there are no distractions. You know, there's no children around, running around, there's no dogs, there's nothing that could potentially distract uh, your buyer. Try to use, if you can, a, a neutral background or like a minimalistic background, something that's, I guess, white or clear or, you know, a sort of neutral color. Um, so it stops, it stops the buyer's attention being sort of straying away um, from you because that effectively should be what they're, what they're interested in. Now, a lot of these platforms, um, you can use like a set background. So you can upload like an image. Um, I guess if you're using an image, try, try to make it relevant. And um, so I guess you could use your branding, uh, you could maybe use a few products or images of products or use an appropriate image that tells a story about your brand. And I'm just looking, you know, I know that we've got Ogilvy, right? And I'm sure you guys have probably got backgrounds that you use, but you know, as an example, if it was an image of say like, you know, a field of potatoes or, or it could be a tractor and trailer or something that tells a story, rather than you know sitting and i know you guys are not there but you know sitting in your busy kitchen and someone your other half trying to like make something and it's all going horribly horribly wrong okay so just think about how to use your space and um, that's that's around you or, or virtually uh, around you and um, to the greatest effect my second point is standing versus sitting now this is an interesting one similar to the to the power pose that we've all done, presenting yourself digitally, standing up instantly gives you more confidence. It allows you to project your voice and also helps you to, to breathe more easily, particularly if you're nervous. You're less likely to slouch, be hunched or fidget standing up. Um, but, but this, you know, standing up may feel a little bit unnatural um, for the majority of us, particularly, you know, as we've spent pretty much the past year on video calls sitting down. But I would recommend if you're if you're gonna try it, the next time you go onto one of these calls, try standing up and see how see how you feel. I guess. It really, it's up to you if you feel more confident standing up uh, or sitting down, you know, do what, do what works best for you. But, um, you know, from people I've spoken to in terms of pitching and making a really good impression and doing that power pose is, is, is easiest and best to, to do it standing up. Embracing the pause. We all get nervous. Okay, it's okay to get nervous. It's good to get nervous. When we're presenting, 
digitally, it's very, very easy to start talking very, very fast continuously without taking a break. And that just sounds really muffled. It's, it's not clear. And if you start talking really quickly, or if you've got a tendency to talk quickly, this is amplified when we present digitally. So try and be conscious about the speed that you're talking and try and take regular pauses. Uh, taking regular pauses as you're speaking, it helps to calm yourself uh, and it also helps you to deliver a more powerful and, and memorable pitch. And I guess, it's, I guess it's quality, not quantity. Um, so when you're delivering your pitch, and I know Kerry's going to go into more detail, um, you'll probably have a limited time. So it's the quality of what you say in that time that's important, not how much you say. So I guess plan exactly what key points and messages you want to tell. The buyer at the other end, they probably don't have the time and they probably don't really want to hear your whole life story um, as much as it's interesting. They want to hear the key messages about your product and brand of what's important, important to them. Using a pause where there's a clear silence actually helps to, to regain attention. So if you find yourself talking a lot and talking you know, quite quickly and you can see your buyer starting to lose attention, just stop. Take a pause and instantly I've seen all your eyes prick up because I've stopped talking. Something's changed, the dynamics changed. So what's happening? Okay. And um, so that's something to consider is if you do find yourself just talking, 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 just take a little break, take a little pause, and then continue. Eye contact. Um, maintaining eye contact is is probably one of the most important elements of your pitch when you're presenting digitally. There's nothing worse than looking at the top of someone's head. So if I was to talk like that for 10 minutes, like very quickly, you're going to get switched off. So, you know, don't, if you are planning um, to use notes, and I would recommend using notes, there is a very sort of handy tip that I've started doing. Um, use your screen to your full advantage. Your buyer can only see, they can only see you and your surroundings. They can't see what's on your screen. So they can't see what you're looking at, unless, of course, you're screen sharing. So I would recommend typing, typing up your notes. Actually have them on the screen. Have them on the screen minimized or reduced in size so that you can partly see, partly see your buyer or audience, and you can also see your notes. This way, you don't need to look down and your eye contact remains forward looking looking at the screen another thing to consider is if you're using two screens so if your webcam's on screen one but the whole time you're sitting looking at screen two that it's not it's not great for for someone that's watching and as a potential buyer you know as much as your products could be excellent and fantastic that experience is going to leave them with a bad impression now i, I don't know if you guys can tell but this whole time that I'm speaking to you at the moment, um, I'm actually looking at my notes. Um, you guys are about 10% of my screen at the moment, and the remainder of my screen is on my notes. But hopefully you can't tell. I, I don't know, I'd like to know if you could tell, if you could see my eyes moving, but it's just that I wanted to demonstrate that I'm actually looking at my notes right now. And hopefully you can't, hopefully you can't tell. Planning and Preparing, um, we'll look at screen two, screen one, screen two. Um, plan and prepare. Um, as I say, you're likely to have limited time uh, with your buyer, so plan exactly what you want to say. The time that you spend planning and preparing will make your pitch go really smoothly. You'll know it inside out, and there won't be any stuttering or stumbles. And I guess that's also the benefit of using notes as you've got it there so it's very hopefully very fluent and practicing um, I guess one of the most valuable things you can do is to practice record yourself and watch yourself back 
as cringy, as absolutely cringy as this may feel, it's by far the best way to get instant feedback on the way that you look, the way that you communicate, the speed at which you talk, and also your use of, of pauses throughout. And I guess it's one of these things when you record yourself and you watch yourself back, you're like, do I really do that? Do I really look like that? And I didn't realize when, I, when we started doing these video calls, like at the start of lockdown, and there was a session that was being recorded, and the whole session, I was talking at the screen like this. And it was only when I, I, looked, I looked back and I thought, I said, get your hand away from your face. What, what are you doing? And it was only just that experience of that recording and watching myself back that you, you then realize what, what you do well, but also what you can improve on. So before you do go into, you know, pitching with a buyer is, is record yourself, you know, it's, it's very, very valuable. And my final point is, is start, start and finish with a bang. A virtual, I read just recently, uh, this is quite funny, a, a virtual presentation is a bit like a plane journey. So you remember, you remember the beginning when you take off and you remember the end when you touch down. But you, you don't really, the middle bit is a bit sort of, you don't really remember what happens, it's a bit of a blur. So when you are doing, you know, if, if, you, if you're doing your pitch, that's why I guess it's important, if you're going to prioritise any parts of your pitch, it should be at the beginning and at the end. So the hook, as Kerry, I don't want to spoil the show, but the hook at the start um, to attract attention and first impressions, really helps to gather momentum and um, it's the thing that's like wow here's a start you know here we're here to find out about ogilvy it's like captured my, my my attention here we go the middle bit i'm sure is very interesting but i've just had three messages and my kids are screaming out the back and um, so that's fine and then i remember the end okay great i want to find out i want to find out more so i guess it's that start piece and also your closing uh, remarks. Try and make it as memorable um, for good reasons uh, as possible. Leave your buyer hopefully feeling inspired and eager to find out more. So if you're going to take anything away from tonight, start and finish is like a plain journey. And on that note, I'm going to, to hand back over to, to Kerry. Thank you very much, Callum. And if you could put on the next slide, please, that would be great. And some some real uh, synergy here with a traditional pitch, but a traditional pitch will work digitally. Some very in, uh, things that you do in conjunction, that's really useful. Thank you. So perfecting your pitch. There's usually about eight parts to a pitch. You can fit these in 60 seconds. Uh, you need to start with a hook. You need to attract attention. It can be provocative. It's got to have impact. It could uh, in, in initiate an emotional response, but it demonstrates opinion. Not just any opinion, but a well-founded, market-driven opinion. Now, out of all the pictures we had a few minutes ago, John was the only one that had a hook in there, and that was about plastics. Okay. I would have turned that around a bit and said, and start, I'm going to make up some figures. Did you know that 50% of the UK consuming population want to get rid of plastic? Hook, straight away, hooked. Statement, it's emotional, it's strong, it's, it's opinion, but it's a well-founded, well-grounded opinion, and it has impact, okay? The next thing you need to think about, well, what's the problem? What is the problem that your product is trying to solve? Who are you aiming it at? What's the market reason for it? How is your product going to help this? So it's straight away there, you could have something like, did you know that 70% of hospitality, man uh, hospitality outlets are looking to have sustainable packaging? If you're pitching, say, to the wholesaler or something. Or did you know that the growth in craft spirits is X? And in Scotland particularly, they are, and you start to think about, the problem you're trying to solve because that's where your problem your product comes in and the solution very briefly demonstrate why your product is the solution to this problem why it's feasible 
if they list it, what would the outcomes be? So then you could bring in some terms of how fast it's selling, what you'd expect it to sell, you know, just some bits and pieces. You've only got 60 seconds or maybe a couple of minutes. Let's think about, it. you've probably got about five minutes usually, but think about the key nuggets of information that's going to want to make this buyer buy your product, list your product, stock your product, keep your product on their shelves. Your solution's got to be innovative. There's no point in being a me too, being there, done that. Think about the innovative, the USP, the story, the why, and create that interest in your product. Make your product interesting. And the, the thing to remember there is, at this point, is, you know, you're used to dealing with your product. You deal with your product day in, day out. How's the, another person going to see your product? You bring your knowledge you have on your product, your business, the ethics, the culture, the environment, the family story, whatever it may be, and think about how that person, why is that important to that buyer? You might be pitching to a buyer for whom, you know, it's all about family products, local food, ethical ways of production, sustainable packaging, sustainable prices. You need to know that already. We've talked about that before. But then that's where you start to your product can be a solution to their needs. Now, you're going to have to think about money. You'll already have prepared. We're going to do a little bit about negotiation later on. You'll already have done your homework. You know, Callum mentioned plan and prepare. We've talked about it at previous webinars. You need to know the deal, you know, what you're going to be selling it at, how much money that's going to make them, whether that be percentage or cash, which are the place to the strengths you need to highlight what's important to them you're going to have done some background about what they expect so you're going to have to put something in there about money and then you might want to think about okay because this you might be a small person a small buyer talking to wanting to scale up your product then what's the scalability issues if you're going from selling through a farm shop to say selling to one of the the, the discounters or the smaller supermarkets and 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 you've got to demonstrate that well okay at the moment this is this it normally retails at this should we be talking scale of this? Then we'd be thinking about a price like this. That would give you a margin of this with a turner of X number moving off the shelf. That will give you a profit or a cash margin of an X per week. So you've, you've got the information on the prices, the money bit down to, down to absolute T. You know it. In the money piece, you can also bring in the market size. You might want to introduce there about the, the, the proportion of the gin market that Craft Gin has, and potentially if you've got the figures, the proportion your product has, if you don't, then your, your product is growing at X in the X percentage in the year on year, and that gives you, and you start to sort of fit your product into that growth, that growth sector of the market. You'll need to have thought a little bit about risk, okay? So you might need to mention the competition. You might need to mention IP, intellectual property, or production, supply chain, distribution. Start to think, what are the things the buyer's going to start picking up? Is he going to be worried, I can't supply him if he puts a big order in? Is he going to be worried, I can't get it turned, my production turned around quick enough? So you're going to have to thought of, think about the risks that would be in the buyer's mind and start to make sure you've got them. If they, you know, set, you know, head them off at the pass by putting them in your pitch, but be ready to answer any questions on that. Don't introduce an issue at this point. If you feel yourself, you're a bit worried about distribution, don't come in like, oh, well, we thought we'd have a problem with distribution, but we're not gonna have because you're introducing a weakness. So you don't wanna do that, but be ready, have that information, that thought to hand. For those of you who have a really good family story, uh, whether it's based on the farm, whether it's, uh, you know, your work is a family business, you should work with your husband, your sister, whatever, people have said that tonight, talk about the team. Demonstrate that you, it's not just you, because a buyer doesn't want to know it's just one person. That's, that's a bit scary, okay? So what about the team? What's, who's the team behind the product? A bit about the skills, their experience. You know, have any of them had any recognition? Have you won any awards? Those sorts of things. You can sneak those into your pitch really useful really good and you need to think about how you're demonst going to demonstrate that you've got traction you know what have you done what are you doing to get traction for this product you know that might you'll bring in here sort of the customer base you're working with not giving anything confidential away but the customer base you're working with how you interact with them how you interact with the end consumer funding social media activities you're doing to support your product you know to make sure that you're creating the demand that will pull your product through the store think about those things and have any stats you might have to validate so examples you don't need to name 
the example would be you might say at the moment we're in 10 farm shops and we have grown our, our sales ix we've scaled the product we've supported it with this it might be tastings it might be social media it might be events whatever it may be so think about the traction you've created around your product. So you are demonstrating that you are really behind this product. You know, when I was a buyer, I used to get people that owned companies coming in and selling to me. Great, fantastic. You knew their heart was in it. Then you'd get a sales broker coming in and he'd, they'd be there with, I mean, we're talking the 1980s, but he'd be there with a folder of 10 different products. How could he be supporting all of those products? Now, I know sometimes we have to use that, but think about how the buyer is going to feel. OK, it's really, really important that your enthusiasm, your passion, but well-founded, good business, sensible passion, not just emotion. You know, it's a balance. And then you've got to ask, you've got to end with an ask. What do you want the buyer to do? This is that big bang that Callum was talking about. What action do you want the buyer to take? So end with an ask because it need, that's, that will progress the conversation. Does that make sense to anybody? Before I go into the next slide, has anybody got any thoughts on that? Any questions? It depends who you're promoting to, and, and I, I can't remember the logistics of how the, the, the expo is going to work, but you need, if you're trying to get into, say, a deli, right, a deli in Stonehaven, right, you need to actually understand what that deli is currently selling. So if you look at Granger's in Stonehaven, you know, they've got a range of stuff. They don't tend to focus on Scottish. They leave that to other stores in Stonehaven. But you need to demonstrate that you've actually looked at the stores. You understand what that buyer's uh, out outlets are like, uh, whether it be retail or hospitality or food service, whatever. You know, but you need to demonstrate that. So it might well be if you are looking to pitch to a supermarket you, and you're looking to pitch in and, and, and please do like, um, Fiona, come in here if, the, if you've recently been doing this, but you know, you'll need to, you might have a lead product that you want to get in there, or you might have a couple of products you want to get in there. It really depends who you're pitching to. If it's a supermarket and you're looking at pitching, a, I don't know, let me think about, pro, uh, say a canned product or something, then you're gonna have to understand how the canned fixture works. You know, they'll have X number of facings for a product and, and, and where it goes. So you know, one product, one tiny little product is going to get lost unless you've got a good USP, a good story, a good reason for it to be given the right space on the shelf. So it, it's it, what will be difficult with the expo is if people are doing one video for every different type of buyer, because you really do need to understand what type of buyer you're pitching to and about their, um, you know, their outlet, that what they're representing. Does anybody want to add to that? Because there are other people that could add to that. Does anyone want to add to the comments and, and answer that question? I don't think we were always trained to do so. Just from my background of kind of more FMCG, kind of big business training, it was always before you went to see any buyer, if you hadn't walked one of their stores, at least one of their stores. And at places like Tesco head office, you knew which store the buyer would focus his time in and probably did his weekly shopping. So you would spend, you know, we would always arrive a good hour, an hour and a half before we needed to be at that meeting so that you could go around the most local stores to the head office and really familiarise yourself with what was going on. And then you can talk kind of so, with, yeah. yeah, you kind of know what the buyer, where the buyer's head might be at as well. Definitely. Um, and so, because it's easy now just to look online and look at ranges, but I think you actually have to physically get your. I know it's hard at the minute, but get yourself into store and and have a good walk around and see what's going on. You can still. That's that's absolutely spot on. I mean, I've been chucked out of Sainsbury's years and years ago for checking out my competitors' lines and see what they were stocking. And and even that's important if you're going to pitch to say some, well any supermarket or anybody know what their competition is as well. You know, know what type of people walk through the door. There's no point going into uh you know uh, a, a sort of discount store and trying to sell a top end i'm really going to hurt somebody at the moment i'm desperately trying not to say the wrong thing but you need to understand the consumer that shops in that store you know there's no point in pitching a product that just does not match the consumer profile and you can find a, it is hard at the moment but you can find a lot out online you know you can look at the way people the, the language the the customers are using your target customers are using on the websites that the, the 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 what they're trying to be their ethos their story how does your product add to that you can learn a heck of a lot 
actually off the internet. There's a lot of information out there. You just have to look at the style, what they're trying to achieve, and you can pull out the aspirations from that, the way they talk about themselves. And then the trick is there, well, actually, my product adds to that. It supports that ethos, you know? Anybody else got any thoughts on that before we, uh, or, or does that make sense? So without fail, every single one of you, okay, you said your name, that's fair enough, but then you went into uh, what your business did, what your products were. Some people added a little bit about story, which was really interesting. So name of mum's house, the farm, loved the bit about the whole process was on farm. But do you see what I'm saying? There weren't any hooks at the beginning. John, you had a hook in yours, but it was a bit further down the line. If you just started with that, did you know plastic, blah, 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 then you've given somebody a reason to listen to you straight off because plastic's going to be an issue to everybody. Yeah? Any other questions on that pitch slide? Sorry, is there a fear that you start to sound a bit dragon again and just a bit creepy? But that's the bit that really puts me off that hook thing. Because I know when I've been a buyer as well, uh -huh. I can sometimes find that approach. Maybe it's just my style. I find it a little bit. Someone's been on a training course, and it just makes me almost cringe. I think so it's really, how it's delivered. I really. So that's what it is. It's how do you make it feel natural, and it doesn't feel like you're giving it the dragon's den pitch? Because that could, sometimes just makes me go ah. No, no, I <laughs> quite. And you, I watch Dragon's Den, and you think, oh. Oh my God, you sounded like, you know, you're on some sort of soapbox and I'm probably sounding like that now. So I apologize for that. But it's what you followed up with Fiona. It's if you follow it with the, you make it relevant to your company and every, you can be strong without being soapboxy. You know, you can be, I mean, when we were doing this, we did this with some companies in Perth and then uh, we did that. We did some role play and the hook was, do you know how many, how many animals are shot every year on farm? And it just felt like I fell over, you know, but, the fact is, it's the way you say it, and it's what you follow it with. So you can be shouty, cringy, like you say, but you can also be strong and humble at the same time. You know, don't apologize for what you've done. You've all worked really hard. You put your life and soul into your product and your business. You need to do the best by it. So you've got to be strong. But the hook is, the whole thing about the hook, Fiona, and I know you know this, but the whole thing about the hook is grabbing attention and then saying, we're market led, we're responding to the market because this is what we're doing. You know, there are loads of products out there that would be fairly similar to many of the products you are pitching. And it's about that making it stand out, making somebody remember you. Does that make sense, Fiona? Yeah? yeah. Anybody else? Sorry, is it maybe uh, the hook may vary uh, uh, based on the audience? I agree Absolutely. With you. A small group, you don't have to go overboard, you know what I mean? Um, it can be very cash flow. Uh, Your hook, you, you need to, you can't have one pitch that works for everybody. You're absolutely right, John. The pitch, the hook, elements of all we've gone through there will change whomever you're talking to. They'll be adapted because a you'll be giving people different the people are yeah, buyers will have different um there'll be different outlets and they'll have different consumers and and different things will appeal to them and that's why if you know that an outlet is really pushing on natural sustainable blah 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 you're not going to go in you, you know you know straight away the sort of hooks they're going to be interested in yeah so you're absolutely right it will change it will modify okay Callum, could we have the next slide? So this is a bit of a challenge. Does anybody want to do a pitch based on what we've just talked about? No, come on, somebody's got to do it. No, I'm going to be brave. Oh, really? Maybe later. Okay, let's have a wee look at negotiation then, Callum, please. Okay. Okay, now I've um, tried to just pull out some key things here. And we've got this slide and another one on hints and tips. And then it's over to discussion. So we might go back to those 60 second pitches. So a bit like pitching, negotiation is a lot about preparation. Okay. So I've, I've split it into eight steps there. 
Uh, I'm now conscious about putting my hand on my face, Callum. I've split it into eight steps. Uh, the purpose of the diagram is that whatever you do in a negotiation, where, before a negotiation, and this, is, this is the money bit, you will know the ideal price you'd like to get for your product. But you will also, well, you should also know the limit, the absolute minimum you can get. Now we can all, we've all made mistakes here. I once had a million pounds worth of frozen peas on my books as a buyer, because I overbought. But it worked out, the market turned, we sorted it out, made a profit. It's a little bit scary for a while, but anyway. But we all know the limit. So, and knowing the limit is about knowing your costs, all your costs, the minimum you need to sell your product for. And where a lot of businesses fall down, especially small businesses, they don't know all the costs, they haven't added all the costs in, they've maybe forgotten about VAT, they've maybe forgotten about distribution, they've maybe forgotten that actually they need to put a little bit in there for marketing and promotion. So you need to know your own parameters. So this, I'm not, I can't show it now with my mouse, the bit between your ideal and the limit is where you're going to negotiate, well, somewhere along that spectrum. And equally so, the client, the buyer, is gonna have an ideal they wanna pay for it, and it's gonna be a lot less than your limit. But they are gonna have a limit that they can go a maximum they can pay for it. And that'll be based on, profit margin, other, other deals they have on with other suppliers, what the competition is doing, what their strategy is doing, what they want to do in their range review, whole heap of stuff. For me as a buyer, I got a base salary, but then the best, the, deal, the more the better the deals were that impacted on my bottom, bottom line, that, that impacted on my salary at the end of the year. So it was really important to me, you know? So your client, the buyer is going to have a limit. And the sweet spot or the bit you're going to be talking in is called the bargaining arena where those two lines overlap. So your limit, their limit. Somewhere in there you will settle if you're going to do a deal. Does that make sense? Try to show it quickly. So let's think about the, the, the stages of negotiation. You need to prepare. Oh, no, no, that, thanks. So you need to prepare and that's about being proactive. It's about that store visit to the store. It's about seeing what other products are on the shelf. Well, why are they there? What, what's the link to them and the customers? Quite often, if you're talking to a supermarket, you're going to have to recommend something that comes out of the range. You know, you can't just say, well, reduce that facings from eight to four and fit mine in there because it's not just about supermarket shelf. It's about the warehouse as well. So you're going to have to proactively prepare. You're going to have, you know, clear objectives. So that's a bit about the pitch. You know, where does your product fit into this range? And that's so there's a lot of information gathering and it's a bit about developing a strategy. What if the buyer says to you, so where, where, what about in three years time? How's that way or six months down the line? What, where do you expect that to be? And what do you expect? You know, have your strategy thought out. So this preparation is actually one of the most important things you can actually ever do. Because you only get one chance. You know, there are a few buyers that came through the door in my offer, uh, through suppliers, sorry they would never come through the door again because they completely wasted my time, okay? And, and that sounds a bit arrogant, but you know, there's a lot of people that want to sell to buyers, you know, so you've got to make your product stand out. You've got to make the most of your time. Why would you waste it by not preparing? In the negotiation, when you're sitting there with a the buyer, you'll start discussing things. It's natural. You'll have a disagreement because they will want one thing and you'll want other. And it's not going to be like an argument, but the discussion is an opportunity while you're chatting away and you're discussing. It's an opportunity to learn about what the buyer's looking for. You can gather information. You can test some of your assumptions you might have made about their ranges and what drives them. So think, think carefully about that. Think about how you elicit, you gather information but also think about your behavior. Don't get emotional. It's, it's very difficult not to get emotional because this is your pride and joy. This is you've worked sweated tears. You might have mortgaged your house for this, whatever. But the main thing about the discussion phase with a buyer is to listen more than you talk because by listening, you learn. And that's really key. And then you'll get to sort of like signaling and proposing in discussion. That's when you start recognizing signals. You might start to think, hear things like, well, as things stand or in its current format. So that's a signal to think about, oh, 
I can explore that. I can ask some questions about that. As things stand, well, what do you mean? Can, can you just could you just elaborate a little bit on that? Or in its current format, is the case size wrong? Is it looking for a mixed case? Is the bottle too tall? You know, as things stand. And then you start to get to the stage. You quite naturally move into the pr proposition. So you start, you know, you start like putting things out there for the first time, like make an offer, sort of thing. But propose a solution oh well what about if we started to think about this and you oh thank you you start to think about actually moving on this conversation and then starting to you start to present your responses and you offer up variables and this is where you can it's called packaging but you can bring lots of things into trade you can think about well we do we're actively on social media we're creating a following we've got quite a following we've got this we've got that we've got loyalty so you start to bring things in that start to support the listing of your product and when you're thinking about packaging there's there are rules you need to think about here it's got to be relevant to the buyer the things you're saying if you're talking about value add additional things you're doing to support your product that are completely irrelevant to the his outlet and his consumers then you're wasting your time but think creatively what things are of interest to them? What issues do they have? What do they have problems with? Could you help solve them by delivery or uh, a different day of delivery, a different case size, whatever it might well be? I don't know. I don't know what buyer it'll be. But start to think creatively about how you package your product and what you bring with it to the negotiation. And if you, if you start to make concessions, you need to get something back for them. You're not going to give them away for free. And if you, when, you, when you're starting to think about offering something, always think about what it costs you, but really importantly, what's the value to them? Because you might be in the situation where making a slight change doesn't cost you, doesn't add anything to your cost really, but it makes a huge difference to them. So it's really valuable to them. So you have to kind of put yourself in their shoes and think, Okay, so what, yeah, that might be really worth something. And you explore whether that, what's that's worth to them. And then you almost get to this sort of bargaining. So, so don't give anything away for free. You'll say, well, what if I do this, then perhaps you could do that. So always, if is your price tag here, if I think about that, would you consider not, okay, I'll do that because they could say, yeah, thank you very much. I'll take that. You know, so use if as a price tag and start thinking about making propositions. And you then just start battering things back. We've all been in that situation. We negotiate every day of our lives, whether it's just with our kids or our husbands or our wives, we negotiate all the time. So you start thinking about if you do that, then perhaps I could do that. Or if we change this, would you consider doing that? So link uh, and think about that. A trick you might get pulled into is like, breaking everything up into little bits and agreeing bits along the way link everything together because what what's um an easy giveaway for you you might be able to use later on in in the negotiation so so link all the things together trade everything okay and when you get to the end of the negotiation we've all been in the situation where you just think oh, i'm just bloody fed up of talking about this now i just want to go home and he said, yes, yes, that's fine. Yeah, no, that's great. And then if you leave a situation, you, you, you rush an end. It's like you're both left feeling a little bit uncomfortable. The buyer's left thinking, have I just been wasting my time? And or you could be left thinking, hmm, I could have got more for that. So your close, how you bring a negotiation to a close has got to be really credible. It's got to... Um, be a win-win everyone's somebody's got to feel they've won something and you know there's nothing wrong in the buyer thinking he's really won you over and got loads of stuff because you might have given a load of stuff that he really values and it's not a lot of cost to you he feels great fantastic job done you've got what you want he thinks he's won or I, I don't want to use winning but he thinks he's got the best deal whatever you do when you bring that close you, you start to close the negotiation you must confirm what you've done it so in the days when i was a buyer we didn't have text we didn't have emails well we did towards the end you know it was like everything was done in writing so somebody would come in we'd do a negotiation they'd go away they'd write me a letter and i'd get it three days later everything is so much more instant now but it's still really important to actually confirm everything you've agreed because 
you might go away thinking one thing and the buyer might go away thinking another and we know the trouble that can lead to so negotiation is a process it's nothing to be frightened of you do it every day but you can do it really well if you think about it in terms of breaking it down into steps doing that preparation listening trading things don't give anything away for free and remember to to confirm make sure you're both on the same plane you're both in agreement with what you've been agreed so next slide please Cameron uh, Callum hints and tips for negotiation prepare know the buyer's business you have to at least have walked around that shop or gone into a restaurant that uses their products listen during the negotiation during the discussion you learn so much more and you'll uh, then you start to propose those solutions and making them conditional if is the price tag if you then perhaps i value your concessions from the buyer's point of view and think creatively about those concessions it might well be that you say look <coughs> excuse me i don't normally deliver on a tuesday but listen, I could be deliver. I could deliver on a Tuesday. You might already have thought that doesn't make any difference to me, but they might think you're making a massive concession to them, and they're going to feel good about that, and they're going to think, yeah, that, that's great. They're being really fair there. They're going out of their their way. So think creatively, but don't give anything away for free. Always value what you've got to offer. You know, don't be saying, oh yeah, yeah, that doesn't cost me much. That's fine. I'm happy to do that. Why would you say that? Does that make sense? Any questions on any of those things? Has anyone come up? Has anyone any fallen into any of those pitfalls before? I know I have. I completely have. Sometimes I just like, if I'm shopping, I say you, you, you negotiate and you're buying a new oven or something. And you think, oh, I want to get that cooker hood free. And you just get to a point where you think, oh, I just can't be bothered with this. I'm just, just going to, you know, we've all done that, you know. I, I have a question actually. Um, we we get all the time the request for samples, samples for the product. Uh, we are happy to give the samples for free, but uh, there is a debate in our team whether we charge for the delivery. For the delivery. Yeah, because that's, 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 so. What do you? That's, I mean, what do you think is because this is the initial stage. We don't want to charge any 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 you know any of the charges to the customer. But at the same time, as you said, I mean, do you think we need to charge them to show them that, you know, value or effort? I, I would say no at this stage because you're not negotiating for a listening. They're just looking at trying to understand about your product. But I would make them aware of the value of that. And then you bring that into the negotiation. I think it's, it's uh, I mean, there's, there's limitations here, but at the, at the, the start, you're, you're trying to get your product out there a little bit. It's a bit like building in the, the, a budget for sampling in, a, in an event or a promotion. You have to build that into your budget. That's a natural thing to expect. But I think it's not unfair to, to, to say for the buyer to understand the value of that. And maybe you need to calculate what you're willing, the, the, the price, the, a package of samples that you're willing to give away as that sample and say to them, look, this is really expensive. We what we do is pe we tend to know people want to see the quality of this, so this is what we've put together. So make it a positive that you've put something together, but make you know they will know the value of that because you'll have explained that. Would anybody say anything different to John? Would anyone have any other advice for John? We just recently did have to pay for samples, and at first I was a bit like, well, that's a bit cheeky, and then I thought, well, at least they know we're probably genuine that. If we didn't pay for the samples, then I probably wasn't a genuine customer. But because I did need to see the samples and check they would fit the bottles, I was happy to pay for the samples. So I guess it gives you an indication as to how genuine they are, maybe. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. 